Hi, how you going? Welcome to York Street. We hope and pray that this sermon will be encouraging and fulfill your spiritual needs that you have during this season. So grab a cuppa, your Bible, and a comfy seat, and let's get into it. I would like to invite Carlene up. Carlene is going to be sharing the word with us this morning. She's got an incredible message um, to share, one that I hope will really encourage and bless each and every person here. Um, Why don't you join with me as we pray before we begin? Our Father God, thank you so much for this morning and this opportunity to gather together in your presence and press into learning and growing and um, examining our hearts and um, pressing them further towards our relationship with you, God. I just pray that this message this morning would meet us with open ears and open hearts to hearing more about you. God, what more could we want on this beautiful day than to grow in our relationship with you? We ask that you would pull us closer towards you through the words that Carlene is about to share, and we thank you for the time that you have spent with her as she's prepared this message, and we thank you for the things that you have laid on her heart to share with us. I know that you have an important message for our congregation this morning, and that your desire is to draw us closer to you and see us grow and challenged and press closer towards you in our faith, God. And we just ask that you would do that this morning um, as we come before you. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank- Thanks. Good morning. For those that don't know me, um, my name's Carlene. I'm one of the, I've got uh, the privilege of being one of the elders here, and I also have the privilege of bringing you the message this morning. And thank you to Jess and the team for the incredible worship this morning, although it means that I've got less voice now. <laughs> Just a little bit about myself. My husband Ross and I live on a small farm about 30 minutes out of Ballarat with our cows, our horses, our dogs, and our chooks. Um, I am the mother of four wonderful children and the grandmother of 11 grandchildren, beautiful grandchildren. First of all, what I'd like to do is um, to wish a happy Mother's Day to all the mums out there, to all the mums, the stepmums, the grandmothers, great-grandmothers, the mother figures who show nurture to, to children as they grow, and especially to all the crazy but cool aunties out there. Yeah. (laughs) I was lucky enough to have lots of aunties. My mum was uh, one of six girls, and they were Viking descendants, so they were pretty cool. Uh, Now, as for me, I'm a um, a psychologist. I work full-time still. Um, I work in a government department um, in policy development, mostly in the area of disability. So while Mother's Day is a time set aside to celebrate and honour the women in our lives who have nurtured and loved us, I just want to take some time to acknowledge, um, as, as others have done this morning as well, that for some people this can be a really tough time. There'll be those here today and listening online who will have lost their mums, whether it be years ago or just recently, and Mother's Day tends to just um, sharpen that grief a little bit. There'll also be uh, people out there who are separated from their mothers through time and distance, and days, special days like this just make you miss them even more. So I just want to acknowledge that and let you know that we care for you and that um, we love you and we're praying for you. There will be others here today who will be experiencing a different type of grief, and that will be the grief of something that they never had, As we talk about the nurture and love of mothers, there'll be people who have never experienced that, that that wasn't their experience growing up. And so for those, what what I'd like to say is that you are part of our family, you're part of this church's family, you're part of God's family, and God is the perfect parent who loves you unconditionally and just wants you to be his child. So this morning, what we're going to look at is at how the, the way the experiences that we have in life and the beliefs that we develop because of those experiences or because of what we're taught, they can influence the way we understand who we are, the way we interact with the world and other people, and especially the way that we relate to God. Let's pray. 
Father God, I just pray that you'll open our hearts and our minds today to hear your word and to accept you as our Father. In Jesus' name, amen. At 16 years of age, I was sitting in my high school auditorium listening to a guest speaker. That guest speaker was John Smith of the God Squad Motorcycle Club. John was telling us about the love that God had for us. He was talking to us about God as our loving father who wanted us to be his, his children and wanted to bring us back into his family. He told us that God loved us so much that he sent his only son, Jesus, into the world to die on the cross, to pay the price for our sins and provide a way for us to come back to him. Up to that point, um, God had been a reasonably distant figure for me. I, I knew about God, but I didn't know him. But when I heard John talk about the love that he had for me, I, I'd been searching. I'd been searching for something, as, as teenagers do. You know, who am I? What am I here for? And the words that John spoke just really struck an accord. And so if God wanted a relationship with me, I was in. And that was the beginning of my Christian journey. And by the way, I was a Jesus freak, so I'm looking forward to that movie. For me, understanding and accepting God as a loving father was easy. My dad was a loving, gentle, kind, generous man. He showed unconditional love to his children, and I knew from an early age that there was pretty much nothing I could have done to have stopped my dad from loving me. But in his book... John Smith also talked about another encounter that he had. His book, um, this is John Smith, was the name of the book. He was using similar words to the words that he'd actually used when he spoke to us in that, in that high school auditorium. He was talking to a young man who was a member of a rebel motorcycle gang, and he was telling him that God wanted a relationship with him. He was telling him about Jesus, and he used the words that God was a loving father who wanted to welcome him back into a relationship as his child. The man turned to John and with anger in his face said, if God is anything like my old man, I never, ever want anything to do with him. This man had grown up in an abusive family where beatings and neglect were just his everyday life. So our two very different life experiences had a profound impact on the way we viewed and responded to, God's, to John's words and the gospel message. But you see, none of us have had perfect parents and none of us have been perfect parents. There will be things in everyone's lives where experiences from the past will impact the way we view the world, the way we interact with others, the way we view ourselves, and the way we relate to God. As we go through our lives... We develop what we call core beliefs. Um, as psychologists, we call them schemas. And they, they help us to make sense of the world as we navigate through it. Schemas are simply the brain's way to organise information into shortcuts or medical, uh, mental models to help us to stay safe, to guide our thoughts and our behaviours, and to understand new information. For example, we learn from an early age that we shouldn't touch something that's hot. I think I was about three when I learnt that message. Heat burns is a schema that protects us from injury. We don't need to analyse and measure the heat that's being produced from a glowing element on the stove. We just know that's dangerous. Likewise, we can develop schemas in our lives that um, will mean that we see certain people or situations as dangerous based on our experiences. And these are experiences that usually come about as, um, from when we were children. We'll also develop expectations of others and ourselves based on the schemas. Research shows that the way we are going to view the world is mostly in place by the time we're seven or eight years of age. From then on, our brains tend to slot new information and new material into the existing schemas. So we may understand from a young age that something with four legs, a tail and a head is a dog or a cat, but it's also an animal. 
So when we see a, a new animal that we've never seen before, we can slot that in and just expand that schema that this too is an animal. Um, we can also accept, we, t we tend to also accept new information or evidence that fits our schema, but disregard information that would challenge those schemas. As a five-year-old, I was with my family on holidays at um, Queenscliff. And as we were walking back from the beach, all of a sudden, a little dashhound dog raced out of the bushes and clamped firmly on the back of my leg. That was a terrifying experience for me and, and very painful. It drew blood. <laughs> and what it did for me was it developed a schema in my brain that was supposedly designed to protect me from further danger, but it was a schema that said, dash hounds are dangerous. <laughs> as, I, as I grew I've always loved dogs, and we've always had dogs, but we've had big dogs. Because uh, I actually expanded that schema to be a little bit wary of little dogs, because they were like dash hounds. They could come from where you didn't expect them to come from. Now, that schema persisted until a friend of mine asked, her to, asked me to look after her miniature dash hound dogs. Those dogs were adorable. <laughs> they were so cute. They were so friendly and bubbly, and they were just, they were just beautiful little dogs. And so I had to reevaluate that schema. These dogs were adorable. They weren't dangerous. And I had to work out, well, where is my mistrust of particularly dash hounds, but small dogs come from? And had to reevaluate it. You know, even though up to that point in my life I had only ever been bitten by one dog, um, I had generalized that schema to all dash hounds and some small dogs. So I had to reevaluate it and I had to change that schema. And so that schema now says, if you work walking along the street in Queenscliff, watch out for dash hounds jumping out of bushes. So in psychology, we, call, we talk about adaptive and maladaptive schemas. Adaptive schemas keep us safe. Don't touch the hot stove. They help us to live the lives that we should and the freedom to, to walk through, the li through our lives without actually having to think about every situation things become automatic for us. Maladaptive schemas, on the other hand, fuel our fears and prejudices and present, prevent us from living the lives that we want to live and especially living the lives that God has planned for us. In the last 20 or 30 years, there have been some exciting developments in our understanding of how the brain works, especially when it comes to our thoughts and behaviours. The development of functional MRIs allow us to see what is happening in the brain in real time. We now know that as we practice skills, complete an activity repeatedly, or even um, have words spoken to us or speak words over and over again, that the connections in our brains actually grow stronger that are associated with those uh, skills and those activities or those beliefs. So if, a, if we have a schema that tells us that we are worthless over and over again, there'll be very strong pathways that will create a reaction in our brains that will tell us that we are worthless when we're experiencing something. But you know, just as if we practice a skill, a, a connection will grow stronger. If we stop practicing that skill, the connection actually grows weaker. And if we stop doing certain activities, the, it's not like riding a bike, we actually get less and less able to do that activity. So if we've got that schema that tells us that we're worthless, be it from our childhood, be it from a parent, be it from a teacher, be it from somebody that had a significant role in our life, we can actually challenge that schema. If we instead follow Paul's advice in 2 Corinthians and we take every thought captive to the truth that we're not worthless, we are priceless. We've been bought with a price. The price was the Son of God. So we've been bought with a price. We're priceless. We're not worthless. And if we take every thought captive and bring it back to that truth, it will eventually become weaker. 
that schema and it will be replaced by a stronger truth that we are priceless and we are valued in God's eyes. In this way, we're also following Paul's guidance in Romans that we are being transformed by the renewing of our mind. If you'd studied psychology 50 years ago, you would have been, I wasn't quite 50 years ago, you would have been taught that the brain doesn't change, but what now we know that it does. We can see it happening in real time. And brain science is now confirming what Paul told us centuries ago. A Christian scientist, not Christian science, but a Christian who was a scientist, <laughs> told me some years ago that um, we shouldn't be afraid of science because science is studying God's creation and they'll eventually get it right. So even though we may have developed strong maladaptive schemas around who we are, prejudices towards other people, and reactions to certain situations that are not healthy for us or our relationships, these things can be changed. I want to take you through a simple activity to illustrate. So to start with, I'd like you to lend me your imaginations, not your ears, ears too, but your imaginations. We're going to have a look at a slide up on the screen. And what you'll see is that this is a slide where you're sitting in the driver's seat and you're driving along a nice country road, it's a nice clear day, there's no obstacles on the road, presumably you're driving at the speed limit. But you're also driving towards a sweeping bend and you're driving on the left-hand side of the road so that you can be pretty sure that if a car comes around that corner, you're going to be safe. Now, from a young age, you will have been taught and you will have developed a schema that says left side, safe side when you're driving on a road or when you're crossing the road. What I'm going to do in a minute, because I've got Dr. Strange powers, is that I'm going to click my fingers and I'm going to transport you, instead of driving on a country road in Victoria, to driving in California. Now we know that in California you drive on the right-hand side of the road, but what I want you to do is to just imagine how you will be feeling, because it's going to be instant, I tell you. Remember, Dr. Strange. And I, you, you won't have the benefit of, say, 30 hours in a plane thinking about when I get to California and I pick up the, the car, I've got to keep remembering that I've got to drive on the right side of the road. So it will be instant. Now, because I'm very good to you, I will make sure that when I transport you to California, I transport you to the right-hand side of the road. Are you ready? There we go. Now, you're driving on the right-hand side of the road. It's the safe side of the road as you're going towards a sweeping bend because we're in California. How do you feel? If you're anything like me, even after I had a 30-hour flight to Canada, everything inside you will be screaming, this doesn't feel safe, this doesn't feel safe. I need to be on this side of the road. It doesn't feel safe on the right-hand side of the road. Because you've developed that strong schema that says left side, safe side. If you're to stay in California for, say, three to six months, you'll probably find that less and less you'll have to keep telling yourself, I need to stay on the right-hand side of the road. When I come out of my driveway, I need to turn onto the right-hand side of the road. Because what will be happening in your brain is that left side, safe side, those connections in your brain will be getting less and less because you will be challenging them and questioning them and trying to change them. But the right side of the road will feel more and more comfortable because you'll be developing new connections in your brain. Of course, when you come back to Australia, all bets are off. Because what you'll find is that you've got a weak connection there and a strong connection there, but you want this one to be stronger. And for a long time, you'll find that it's, it's difficult to feel comfortable to know which side of the road that you need to be driving on. And if you don't think about it, some days you will, even after a couple of months, pull out of your driveway and just ask us and pull onto the wrong side of the road. Now, when Jesus was born, the Jewish people had been waiting for hundreds of years for the promised Messiah. We know that there are many, many prophecies explaining who the Messiah was, who he was going to be and what he would do. And yet, the Jewish leaders and the teachers of the law who knew those prophecies inside and out failed to recognise him when he finally appeared. 
Why? Because they had schemas around Messiah. And when he arrived, Jesus didn't fit their mould. They had developed their schemas not just on what the prophecies had said, but also on their life experiences and what they thought that they needed. Their life experiences had been of a country oppressed by Rome, of not being free, of not being who they believed they should be. And in their history, um, God had usually sent a mighty warrior to, or a king to um, defeat their enemies. So they expected Messiah to ride in on a war horse and vanquish the Roman oppressors, setting Israel back as God's chosen nation, free and prosperous. That's what they felt they needed. That's what they wanted Messiah to be. But Jesus came riding on a donkey. He submitted himself to the Romans. He allowed himself to be crucified. He died. That's not who they believed Messiah would be. It had all been prophesied. It was all there in the Old Testament, and we can see it now. But they missed it. Why? Because of their maladaptive schema. It prevented them from really seeing who God was. I want to look for a minute at the book of Ruth. It's a fascinating book, and it sits between Judges and 1 Samuel. At face value, you might think it's just a lovely story about the dedication of a daughter-in-law to a mother-in-law. Um, you might see it as a conversion story, and you might see it as God's faithfulness to widows. And yes, it's all of that, but it's more. I believe that the book of Ruth is God's way of challenging the expectations and schemas of the Israelites. Even its placement sits between a time when Israel had been ruled by God's appointed judges, the way God intended Israel to be ruled, and the time of Samuel, when they demanded to be ruled by a king instead. God still used the kings, but it wasn't, it wasn't God's perfect plan for them at the time. The book is about Naomi and her daughter-in-law, Ruth. And at the time that the book starts, there was a famine in the land. And Naomi's husband, Elimelech, took his family to the land of Moab. After he died, Naomi's sons married Moabite women. But then the two sons also died, leaving the three women as um, widows in a strange, and Naomi in a strange land with two daughter-in-laws to care for. She encouraged the women to return to their families so that they could find new husbands and have new families. But both wanted to stay with Naomi. Uh, eventually, one of them returned to her home. But when Naomi urged Ruth to also leave, she said the words often quoted from the book of Ruth. And we're reading from um, Ruth chapter 1, verses 16 and 17. But Ruth replied, Don't urge me to leave you or go back to turn back from you. Where you go, I will go. Where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people. Your God, my God. Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. May the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, if even death separates you and me. The rest of the book recounts how Naomi took Ruth back to her country and there, Naomi's um, husband's relative, Boaz, redeemed the widow Ruth by marrying her, as was the custom, so that when she bore a son, that son would carry the name of his late father and grandfather, because there had been no other male heirs for that line. The final verses in Ruth give us the genealogy showing that this child that she had turned out to be King David's grandfather. And so Ruth is now included in the genealogy of Jesus. I believe the book of Ruth challenges so much of what the Jewish teachers believed. They believed that the Messiah was to be a direct descendant of King David, a holy and royal line. But now, look, the Messianic line now includes a foreigner and a Moabite. The Moabites were hated by the Jews and even cursed at one time by God. 
when they married the Moabite women, Naomi's sons actually broke the, the Jewish law at the time because they were to keep themselves separate from that, that race. But God was in that story and he allowed Ruth's story to be part of the lineage and the story of Jesus. So Ruth's story became his story. When Ruth came back to Israel with, with Naomi, she was a widow, she was childless, she was a foreigner living in Israel. And if the Jewish leaders of Jesus' time had actually encountered her, they would have seen her as the bottom of society. Yet God allowed her to be redeemed and he placed great honour on her descendants. The teachers believed that the Messiah would elevate Israel back to as the only true people of God and back to the, their rightful place as the chosen people alone under God. But the actions of Boaz in redeeming Ruth, even though she was not an Israelite, even though she wasn't an Israelite by birth, actually mirrors the redemption that Jesus came to provide, not just to the Jews, but to the whole world. The Jewish leaders and teachers of the law missed the truth about the Messiah because of the schemas that they had developed about themselves, their race, and the world around them. But what can we learn from Ruth? We can learn that it doesn't matter who you are, what you've done, where you've come from, what has happened to you in the past. God loves you and he wants to welcome you into his family. God wants to also use you in his story if you'll be obedient to him and, let, and, and commit your life to him like Ruth did. Naomi's love and care for her daughter-in-laws led them both to love and honour her, but it also led Ruth to commit herself to God. If we love others, we can actually help them see and respond to the love of God. So that last point is so important as we reach out to a broken and lost world. We can challenge the schemas that others hold because of their, their bad life experiences. Um, and we can mirror God's love to them so that they can start to see and accept that God loves them too. We can show understanding and acceptance instead of perhaps the judgment and condemnation that people may think that they're going to get from church or from Christians. We can love and nurture people into the kingdom. But just like the safety demonstration that you get on a plane where you're told to put your mask on before you help somebody else put their mask on, we need to check our schemas and make sure that they're aligned and brought captive to the truth of God. So how do we see what our schemas are? We first of all immerse ourselves in the truth that God has for us and we see where maybe our beliefs are just saying, yeah, God loves everybody, but maybe not me as much. Or we might see ourselves as saying, um, yeah, God's going to use everybody, but he can't use me. If there's anything that just uh, raises its head when you're reading the word of God, you need to evaluate what that belief is and try and take that thought captive to the truth of God. You know, there's so many verses that uh, speak about God's love in the Bible. They, they, some of them describe the Father heart of God. Many of them describe the Father heart of God. While others also speak of the maternal love that God has for us. I'm going to read through uh, a few of these scriptures. And I would challenge you to let each of these scriptures just sit with you and test your reaction to them. Do they fit your schema for God? Or does your schema need to change? And I, I won't read them through there. We'll actually read them um, off the screen. John 1, 12 and 13. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children born not of natural descent nor of human decision or a husband's will, but born of God. Ephesians 1, 4 and 6. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love, he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will to the praise of his glorious grace which he has freely given 
us in the one he loves. Romans 8, 14 to 17. For those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. The Spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the Spirit you receive brought about your adoption to sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, or Daddy, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. Galatians 4, 4 4-7. But when the set time had fully come, God sent his Son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law, that we might receive adoption to sonship, Because you are his sons, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, the spirit who calls out, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but but God's child. And since you are his child, God has also made you an heir. 1 John 3, 1 and 2. See what great love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Dear friends, now we are children of God and what we will be has not yet been made known. But we know that when Christ appears, we shall see him, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Isaiah 66, 13. As a mother comforts her child, so I will comfort you, and you will be comforted over Jerusalem. And Matthew 23, 37, where Jesus is looking out over Jerusalem. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone those sent to you. How often have I longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings and you were not willing. The word used in these verses where it talks about adoption is actually the Hebrew word for legal adoption, which gave the adopted child the rights of an heir to everything that the father possessed. And that's what we are, heirs to everything that our father God possesses. God is the perfect parent, and he wants us to live in the knowledge of his love as his children. Paul says that now we see in a dim mirror, but then we shall see face to face. Mirrors in Roman times, in the time of Jesus, were actually just polished metal. And so it was very blurry. But he also says that we should throw off anything that holds us back. So let's make sure that there's no schemas holding us back from experiencing all that God has for us. Let's polish that mirror so that we can see God more clearly. Why? because we are children of the living God and he wants us to walk as his children. Let's pray. Father God, thank you that you love us. Thank you that you have called us as your children, that you have made the way for us to come into relationship with you as our perfect parent. Father, I pray that this week we can just identify those areas in our lives that are holding us back from truly knowing you as we should and truly experiencing that we are your children and allowing us to walk the way that you have designed for us to be. So thank you that you do speak to our hearts, Father, and that you will identify those things in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for watching this sermon. We hope and pray that you are able to receive something from God during this time. If you are interested in having a look at our sermon-based studies, please visit our website at www.yorkstreet.com.au or check the description below for a link. And if you enjoyed the video, please share, like and subscribe to keep updated. And as you go out, have a blessed and joyous week.